My name is Leslie Kendall. I'm the curator of the Peterson Automotive Museum, and we are here in our exhibition, Fins, Form Without Function. The reason we're talking about fins right now at the Peterson Museum is because of all the new design themes that people are trying to work with today in Detroit and across the world. We thought that we'd focus in on one design theme that became very, very popular in the 50s, faded into the past, but is now so well remembered that people are collecting cars with fins. The first car that people will notice when they come into the museum is our 1937 Delage D8120 with its one fin running down the middle of the back. People can understand that fins were very important in the Art Deco style, a very important Art Deco theme of the 1930s. I don't think anybody can say for certain where fins came from or why they were first used, but I think most people agree that they were an Art Deco styling element that evoked the feeling of flight. And anything that would evoke the feeling of flight, the feeling of um, progress, the feeling of moving very quickly, was going to be readily adapted by the automotive industry. The first post-war car in the Peterson Museum Fins exhibition is a 1948 Cadillac, which is actually the first American production car to have fins. And they were very small compared to what they look like today, but they were actually derived from the Lockheed P-38 fighter plane, fighter bomber, that had a twin boom tail design that really inspired General Motors designers after World War II. During the war, people really looked skyward for their inspiration. An awful lot of development was taking place in the aircraft industry. And it was only logical and it was only uh, right that some of that development or some of the visual themes uh, of that development overlap into the car world. So eventually, 1948 Cadillacs got the very same fins that the P-38 airplane did. Uh, the next car in the fins exhibition is actually a 1951 Crosley Scorpion. It's a specially bodied Crosley made entirely of fiberglass that the designer took and actually built up the fins on his own personal car so that they would be both higher and sharper than they were originally in keeping with the trend towards higher and sharper fins in general. One of the more interesting cars uh, is our 1952 Spone Palace. People look at that and they see, boy, that really looks familiar. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because it was patterned after the 1951 General Motors LeSabre show car, the car that Harley Earl was so responsible for designing. You look at that and, and you see fins that are just huge. And those kind of fins really appealed to Americans in the day. And indeed, a lot of U U.S. Air Force personnel stationed in Germany ordered their pre-war cars to be fitted with that kind of body kind of as, a, as a, a tribute to the aircraft that they were flying in the time. A lot of times people didn't want to wait for Detroit to catch up to what they were thinking, so they would do cars themselves. And the X-51 Ford is an outstanding example of that. This is a fellow from Oregon who said, you know what, I, I'm going to give my car fins that Detroit probably hasn't even thought about. And he did just that. In fact, that car was considered so advanced in its day that a lot of people thought it was actually a Ford concept car. It was a one-of-a-kind custom car that did the show circuit for a couple of years. Ford got a lot of attention with that car, but what they had in the works was uh, actually even more spectacular. The next car on, on display is a 1956 Cosmic Concept. And to be honest, nobody knows the real history behind this car. It was obviously built by somebody with a strong desire to make their cars look uh, the utmost of fashion in the 50s, so it had really, really large fins in comparison to the rest of the body. We don't know who built it, we don't know why he or she built it, but we're thrilled that it survived. I think the next uh, finned vehicles that people are gonna see are a 1957 Chrysler 300C towing a 1956 Lone Star, which is mounted on a trailer that itself has fins. So here we have a car with fins, towing a boat with fins, sitting on a trailer with fins. And what's especially interesting is that the fins on the trailer were actually aftermarket items that you could get from certain catalogs and just bolt them onto your car, or in this case, your trailer. 
1957 Chrysler is especially important because it's the first year that the Virgil Exner forward look styling was developed to its fullest. Um, that car was so advanced in the day that it blew everybody else into the weeds. It sent General Motors, it sent Ford, it sent everybody back to the drawing board. It was so exquisite, it was so clean, it was so right for the times. The Toyota is especially interesting because it, it shows how an Asian manufacturer desperately trying to break into the American market adopted some kinds of the American styling themes to its cars. Now the cars themselves certainly weren't ready for the American market. They were underpowered for modern conditions. They could only really go 50 to 55 miles an hour um, top speed, but not for very long. So they weren't quite ready for America, but at least Toyota said, you know what? We'll, we'll give them fins and see what happens. Maybe they'll notice us. Well, that didn't quite work out, so Toyota went back to the drawing board, and then it eventually came back into the American market with a Corolla that broke all records of production, uh, even today. And in looking at the Toyota, you can't help but draw a comparison to a lot of the European cars in the 50s, and indeed into the early 60s, that also had fins. Again, an effort to mimic the American market uh, to gain sales and grow the popularity of the vehicles. Perhaps the most iconic fin vehicle of all time is the 1959 Cadillac, and we have a red convertible that's actually absolutely the archetypical fin car of the 1950s. When people think of fins, they can't help but think of the 1959 Cadillac because they're so extreme. And the reason they're so extreme is because of General Motors stylus reacting to the 1957 Chrysler that was designed by Virgil Exner. They looked at that car and said, wow, we are behind the times. We better catch up. And it also shows that they were no longer looking to airplanes for their inspiration. They were actually looking to rockets for their inspiration. Science fiction had more to do with car design in the 30s and 40s than, than it really did in the 1950s. In the 1950s, people were discovering what was actually possible, and a lot of the science fiction had become science fact by that time. Another interesting car in the exhibition is our 1959 GSM, an Alfa Romeo-powered car with little fins that the company said actually helped its aerodynamic design. It's also one of the few cars ever built in South Africa. Like so many small production cars, uh, GSM saturated the market fairly quickly uh, because there weren't that many people seeking that kind of car, but it certainly did well during its heyday. Most people wouldn't consider Soviet Russia a, a, a manufacturing center of Finn vehicles, but back in 62, they built a car called the Chaika, two of which were made in a four-door convertible parade configuration for Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev. And you look at these cars and you, and, and you see that Soviet Russia did adapt uh, the designs of American cars in, on some of their vehicles. They were well behind the curve when you consider that this car was built in 1962 and the last American car to have those kind of fins was built in 1956. Even though that the Soviet Union was supposedly um, against the Western excesses. They couldn't help, it seems, but to adopt a lot of the styling things on the automobiles that evoked that, the exact kind of excess that they were, they were seeking to downplay. The last car we have in the exhibition is called the Mach 5, and I think it's probably the most recognizable car in the entire display because of the continuing popularity of the Speed Racer cartoon series, uh, the most popular cartoon series in the world. And it kind of shows us that even though fins have been around for a while, they're still used, but only in a cartoon way, only in, in a, um, uh, a caricature way, a, a playful way. They're no longer taken seriously. And the car I'm sitting in right now is something that would look very familiar to Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and any number of other Rat Pack celebrities, a Dual Ghia from 1958. The Dual Ghia actually began as a Dodge concept car that entrepreneur Gene Casserole bought the rights to produce. He built a very few of them, barely over 100 on Chrysler chassis. This one, in fact, has a Hemi V8. 
but one major change that he made to the original Ghia design was to add fins. He was aware of the American market and he said, you know what, the car is beautiful, it has wonderful sculptural qualities, but the one thing it's lacking is fins. So put fins on the car and we'll sell a bunch of them. Uh, Gene Casserole put fins on the dual Ghia. Uh, it became very, very popular and would have been even more popular if it weren't so expensive. This car cost almost as much as a Rolls Royce. In fact, what people said was that you settled for a Rolls Royce if you couldn't get a dual Ghia. In every era of human society, we're, we're drawn to things that are distinctive. We want to be associated with beauty and distinction and uniqueness. We want to proclaim our individual personalities. And Finns gave us the means to do just that for a, a brief shining period of time between 1948 and 1965. We could be as distinctive as we want to be. And even today, Finns are popular among people who seek that same kind of distinction. Mark Twasson, owner of Hoppo's Custom Suspension. We're in the city of Lake Paris, California at the Forbidden Fantasy Show 2013. This show is mostly about the mini truckers, the rat rides, and the lowriders. For us as a business, uh, this is a real, real good show. We'll start off the season. It kind of portrays the layout of the year. Um, being here is a real big part of us. We've been coming here for the last 14 years. Um, and it's a big push for the business, bringing out their custom cars and showing off all our product and letting everybody know that we're still here in business after 24 years. Us being a custom suspension shop, we always try to show the quality from the ground up and look at those frames, shows the example of our work starting from the bottom up. Those frames are custom made all by hand. They're welded, molded, grinded all by my guys here at the shop. Uh, they take tons and tons of man hours that you don't see on a factory suspension. The Purple S10, which is owned by my son Alex, um, was built in four weeks uh, by us and the guys at the other shop. Um, we kind of want to bring back the old school look, the old school flavor, being a mini truck and lifted bed. I used to do a ton of that stuff back in the early 80s, and that, that's, that style, that trend is coming back. And we want to be one of the first ones to re-bring that back and uh, to show everybody that the old school is coming back in school and it's uh, something new and different. Coming out to a show like this, uh, for us, it's basically, you know, it's, it's positive advertisement for us. So we come out every year to all the major shows, and, uh, you know, what we do is we just, you know, come out, socialize, show off our work with, like, these chassis, and, uh, you know, most people know us, some people don't, so what we do is come out and, you know, we just talk to people, meet and greet, and uh, from there, it, it could carry on to a possible job. If not, you know, it's just meeting some good people out here. Yeah, it's always good to come out and, you know, constantly show people our work. It's one of those things that they constantly see the name Hoppos, Hoppos, Hoppos. It's one of those things that kind of just gets branded into your head and you automatically remember us. And so that's the reason why we come out and we hit every major show that we can. Um, even if it's mini truck, hot rod, low rod, you no know, low rider, stuff like that. We hit all the shows just for people to, to remember the name and uh, make sure that they uh, order the next set of parts from us. Well, Hoppo's got here, they got, they just started doing the old school. Back in the day, it was the mini trucking, you know, you had the dancing bed and everything, and you can see they're bringing it back. 
you know, and it's 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 it was very popular back then, and it's starting to come popular again. You got you know the hydraulics on the bed. There's some beds that dance up and down. They rotate. They go different directions, and they split. The cars hop. They do all kinds of crazy things. But yeah, this is your mini truck and coming back again. So. Basically, this is uh, my 1992 GMC S15. Uh, it's more of an old school mini truck style. Uh, what I did is I brought back the old camper shell with the mini uh, mini truck blazer windows, and I'm just trying to recreate more of the 80s style into now, like nowadays, you know, trucks and style. So I'm just trying to, you know, bring in the good old days with today's stuff and just kind of bring it out and see if someone else will catch on the style and see if it uh, comes back like back in the days. Uh, a lot of the younger guys my age, they really don't know too much about it. More of the older guys can appreciate the work that I put into it. Um, those guys grew up around that era, so when they see the mini truck with the blazer windows, it kind of brings back memories and uh, makes them feel young again. <laughs> My name is Big T, uh, Big T Vargas, uh, grew up in Orange County. I had a couple boys and three girls, been married 36 years. Uh, so when we started buying, or when I bought this car 12 years ago, uh, we started building it. We kind of stopped a little bit and we continued. So the last six years uh, we have built it and my boy and I possum, basically shoulder to shoulder. And uh, he did the own painting. Uh, we did all the work, 90% of it. The only thing we didn't do is the interior, obviously, uh, at least the stitching, but we installed the interior. We did our, 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 all the hydraulic work, uh, uh, paint work, uh, put it together, assembling it. So basically, uh, my boy Possum and I uh, took us six years to build, and we're to this stage. Uh, we've gotten first place trophies numerous times, best of shows, been in Lowrider Magazine, uh, been in Street Low Magazine with models, and uh, so basically, I mean, it's a 64 Impala SS convertible, and uh, it's taken us a long time to build, but the the uh, outcome of it so far, it's been really, really good, and I've been doing this since I was a kid. So what I did is I was a painter back in the day, a uh, fabricator, and so I kind of passed it on to my boy Possum when he was about 17, 
1617. And after that, uh, he just took off with the painting and body work. And so you see the final results. And uh, I'm very proud of him. And, uh, you know, for especially his wife hanging in there. Because <laughs> we spent a lot of time uh, away from, you know, in the garage. Yeah, so. was my son and I, shoulder to shoulder. And if it, without, without him, I, would, I couldn't have been able to do this to this caliber. But uh, I'm very proud of him, like I said. And uh, him and I have... Uh, have bonded even even closer so whenever it's time for me to leave off this earth uh, I've told him already uh, that this car is his so uh, that's about it at, at least at this stage <laughs> so what you're looking for when you look for a, a, a lot of work on a car is you'll see the navigator behind me that navigator you can see how the wheel is tucked up into the back that takes a lot of fabrication a lot of hours a lot of time a lot of welding and some thought into it to make it ride correctly that's some killer work it's not finished but you can see the time and, and the amount of material that would go into something like that. I'm Robert Garcia at Forbidden Fantasy. Uh, I do custom airbrush artwork and graphics on paint jobs. This is one of the cars we did here with full of movie monsters. So. Uh, well, actually, I have a, a Silverado that I did similar with the same horror movie monsters and the, my buddy, this is his truck, uh, saw it around, so he thought it was cool, so we did the similar thing, but with just different poses and different monsters and stuff, just because it catches a lot of attention. A lot of people know who most of the movie characters are, so it just stands out, something different. I'm into like the old movie monsters and the new ones throughout the ages. I got some from like the old, like the tw 20s and 30s on up from the 80s to the modern day movies. So it's got a little bit of everything from, so people throughout the ages can go have seen movies that they've seen. So I did a little bit of time all together. It was about two and a half, three weeks, somewhere around there. That's it? Yeah, to do the complete, all the airbrush work. Uh, well, I've been drawing my whole life. Uh, I've, drawn on paper and stuff and I was about 12 years old my dad gave me an airbrush and said you should try it out so I did a little bit here and there and uh, then I started working at a shop in Riverside we actually did the special editions for Harley so I got a little bit of my background there where I learned how to do all the masking and take my time to do all the prep work and stuff and then I actually went to Wyotech and learned all the fabrication and the actual mixtures of paint and learned how to work with all the different systems and stuff and then I throughout that whole time I continued to airbrush and I just basically taught myself on that aspect and that's what I got today a good good paint job to draw a crowd is just something different just something that people haven't done before I mean just like tie in old things and new things just something that people haven't seen that hasn't been out there that's what I like to do something that it, it's just not normally done and then you just add to it yeah, usually, I mean, you see cars, you go to car shows, and you see the TV shows on TV, and it's, they're all talking mainly of the mechanical aspect, whereas you have the cars that do have all that horsepower, the engine work and whatnot, but then on top of it, they also look good. You have, they include all the paint work and then all the graphics that go on top of it and airbrush work. So it's not just engine and mechanical, it also it's eye-catching, eye so it's appealing to the eye rather than just mechanical work here and there. The paint job, it also, it's, incorporate so you, you looking in the engine stuff and there's some, something to look at and you go into the interior you have something to look at there and, as well and then you have the paint job which just it's like a gift wrap so it's like Christmas time when you see the outside of your present and it also looks pretty it's not just your interior
We're here today at the Forbidden Fantasy show. Um, it's we're in the Hoppo's booth, Killer Waxing. Um, we're we just want to get our product out to all the mini trucking guys so they can see our product. And we've done uh, several demos out here today, so you can get an idea of kind of what we're doing. Um, Killer Wax is a small company that's growing little by little, and we we're trying to get the word of mouth. You know, we we don't want to big fancy advertisement we want word of mouth so people can really know our product so they can know what we're all about you know and I I believe that's the best way of advertising is you know word of mouth your friend tells a friend and by the time you know it you know everybody's what we call killer waxing Killer waxing is when you use killer wax, it's kind of like a style that we're making up, but it's called killer waxing. So, I don't know, you can see a lot of good cars here today and it's a good turnout. A lot of people want to know, since I'm a new company, they want to know what we're all about and, you know, we're, like I said, we're a small company, but we have, you know, we have deep, the people that manufacture my product has been around for a while, so it's basically, it's high-end product. You know, we use great one Brazilian wax, which which brings a deeper shine, and that's what we're really focusing. You know, to make these really show cars shine really bright. You know, we want to, we're after that wet look. You know, a lot of people don't really focus much on the on the car shows, the cars, the show cars, but we do. You know, we want to bring that deep shine and bring out the beautiful artwork in the car, and you know, that's just something we we focus on the most and. When we start our product, you know, we start with black and red, you know, that's what we, we're trying to start with the black and red because we know everything gets easier from there, but, you know, our product's good on candies and flake and metallics and all that good stuff. Yeah, a lot of people ask to, see, to do, for us to do a demo and so they can see it, so we, you know, we have a selective cars around the shows. We normally pick a handful of cars and we detail it so everybody can see what it's all about. Like I said, you know, it's not about oh, I could talk up a storm and this product is this and this product is that. I'd rather show it, you know, and then that brings customers. You know, today was a really good day for us. You know, we did, we did fairly well and people are really excited to try our product. Since we're a new company, you know, the little shows like this, you know, there are bigger car shows here, it's better exposure for us, you know, what we want to do is get the brand out there so people can, you know, be curious, what's Killer Wax, you know, so it's, this is a good start for us, and we'll be hitting a lot of these shows and, and get our name out there, and that way you guys can see what our product's really about.